hi everyone. I'm Sean and this is Noah. And uh, today we're going to present to you uh, what we've been working on for the past few months for our fourth year design project. And it's a tunable optics liquid lens. It gives us a lot of versatility uh, that you've never achieved uh, with current uh, sunglasses and goggles. Uh, and for the overview of our presentation, Noah's going to start with uh, covering the case for tunable optics. And then I'll go into the engineering with uh, device uh, performance requirements and design. And then Noah will take over with uh, the characterization and the results uh, of our device. And then finally, I'll conclude with uh, some future outlook of uh, our device and our technology. So first, I wanted to make sure that we're all up to speed on the current state of the art for high performance sports eyewear. And what I want to use is a illustrative example of a golf course. So let's say that you're out on a sunny afternoon golfing. There's two main considerations here if you want to have the ideal sunglasses. The first is the fact that it's sunny. Obviously, you want to reduce the light transmission that's reaching your eyes. The second one, one that a lot of people don't appreciate, is that the dominant colors in your ambient surroundings dictate uh, an ideal tint to your uh, lenses in terms of color as well. So here we see green and blue dominating. And if we have this sort of purplish orange you see on the right, you're going to increase the color contrast, increase the detail, and make it a lot more uh, relaxing and just straight up better uh, for a golfing experience. And as another example, here you see people who are cycling, and you're, you're experiencing different uh, ambient colors and different amounts of ambient light, depending on whether you're cycling through the city or if you're going through the road or on the trail. And all of these will dictate the sort of ideal color and transmission combination of the lens. And what this leads to is the fact that um, Oakley has over 75 choices, Oakley being a premium sunglasses provider, uh, where each one of these glasses will provide an optimal experience for a very specific set of circumstances. And they all have a different uh, color absorption spectra as well as a different amount of light transmission. So this is not a very uh, scalable solution if you want to have a good experience in many different scenarios. Um, and for one more illustrative example, we want to use one that's hopefully very familiar to us all, which is skiing. Uh, you get to the ski hill, let's say early afternoon, it's very bright, you use your tinted glasses, but then uh, of course the sun's going to go down in the early winter, and then what happens? You're stuck having an uh, unfortunate tint situation where you're not going to take two goggles, you have to sort of tolerate the tint, and at night it's going to be too dark for you to see safely and optimally. So we wanted to address this problem, this is something that has affected us and many of our friends, and we, we thought that it would be amazing if we could integrate all of the different lens color and tint combinations into a single device, uh, which we call the D-bands goggles informally. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do is have all of these colors tunable and have the light transmission also tunable using a optical liquid system where uh, using hydraulics we will be able to alter both of these parameters. Now you might be thinking to yourself that transitions has achieved something similar to this, and while that might be true in some sense, they are not fast at switching, and they also don't achieve color switchability. Also, um, they are very slow. So what we wanted to do is distill all of these uh, general ideas that we had surrounding this into the following requirements. We wanted to be sure to be able to tune both color and tint, do it quickly, do it manually and automatically, uh, and maintain the high performance optics and safety that uh, people will demand in the modern so next time, uh, Sean will take it away for some more specific requirements. Yeah, so uh, we broke down what Noah just described into some basic engineering requirements for our device. And we actually uh, split our engineering design into diff two different components. One is our, our absorbent material, so our optical liquid. And the second part is our mechanical design uh, for our goggles, so that we could use this optical liquid and uh, have a tunable color and tint. Uh, but for our prototype, we focused uh, directly on just uh, tuning the, kint, uh, the, sorry, the tint so that we go from clear to dark and dark to clear really quick uh, with fast switching. So for, to achieve that, our optical liquid, the requirements were spectral uniformity. We need absorption across the entire spectra. And we uh, wanted less than 20% transmission variance uh, across the spectra, and then we want UV high UV absorption so that the sunglasses actually do what they're supposed to do, protect your eyes uh, with low liquid volume uh, so that it's not bulky uh, on the user, it doesn't add any extra weight, it's comfortable. And then we need 
spectral stability as well as uh, thermal stability, uh, where thermal stability cannot freeze at the Canadian winter temperatures. Uh, so we aim for at least a uh, freezing point lower than uh, negative 20 degrees Celsius. And then our last concern was uh, the toxicity of the liquid. We wanted to not put any sort of toxic uh, materials near your eyes. And then for the mechanical uh, specifications, uh, when you look through your lens, you want the same tint everywhere, no matter where you look through your goggles. And that translates into a thickness uniformity uh, requirement of less than 15% variance. And then we want really quick transition rate so we can beat our competitors of uh, less than six seconds for a full uh, transmission change uh, from both clear to dark or uh, dark to clear. And then we don't want it to wear after more than a thousand transitions. And uh, finally, our last requirement is to do with the flow rate, which is uh, it's another way of uh, uh, showing our fast transition. So we want more than uh, greater than 150 milliliters per minute uh, flow rate into our lens. And now I'll go over exactly the physics of our device, how it works, and uh, what it is. All it's using is the, uh, the simple Beer Lambert's uh, law equation, which is shown uh, on the top right there, where transmission is an exponential function of uh, the negative product of uh, the attenuation coefficient and the uh, thickness of our medium. And so we can control the thickness, but we can see exponential decay in our uh, transmission through the lens. And one thing I want to point out is we're trying to make this super thin so that it is not a burden uh, to add to the lens. You could integrate it to any existing lens. Uh, so to get uh, the profile, so that we could get this nice profile where we get almost a, a full transition, what we need to look at is the product, the attenuation coefficient and the thickness. The thickness is small. We, we're looking at really, really dark liquids uh, in our design uh, for, implementing, uh, for implementing our product. And now I'll kind of sh show the schematics of uh, uh, our product or what we're trying to design as well as the capabilities we can achieve uh, with this system. So on top, we can achieve just uh, complete uh, tint versatility. We would change from clear to dark or dark to clear by changing uh, the thickness within our device. Uh, and then if we add on uh, more, more layers, more complexity, we could get uh, tint and color with uh, two different liquids or with uh, three different liquids in a subtractive color scheme. We could actually get all colors and all tints uh, by varying the thicknesses of uh, the liquid cavities. And this shows how our device is sort of how we designed it. To get a uniform uh, thickness across our entire lens, we need to use a suspended uh, liquid uh, sort of sack in between the lenses and there's a compression force that uh, suspends our liquid and the f then by hydraulic pressure we could add liquid in, increase the, the thickness of our gap and uh, absorb all the wavelengths that we want uh, and give our, our lens the tunability uh, that we're looking for. And for a liquid design we ended up uh, designing two different liquids and they have their advantages and disadvantages. The first one, uh, I guess the important factors are temperature. It cannot, we cannot have it freeze uh, at low temperatures and safety. We want a non-toxic liquid. So uh, the aqueous one is a 50% mixture of uh, sorry, water, 50% and ethylene glycol. Biggest problem with this is ethylene glycol is toxic. It's really toxic by ingestion and it's a mild irritant on your skin or in your eyes. So uh, that's the problem with this liquid, but it's extremely stable color uh, and long-lasting, long but it is also susceptible to UV, uh, so low UV absorption, but it's susceptible to UV degradation. Uh, so our more ideal liquid is uh, using carbon black nanoparticles in a silicon oil, which is completely safe. Uh, the particles are, are suspended uh, and you cannot inhale it, so it's a, it's a safer medium and we use carbon black nanoparticles less than uh, 500 nanometers and we get a very uniform uh, spectral absorption. Uh, but the problem with this is the stability of our suspension. Right now we can only uh, keep it stable for two weeks. So we went ahead with our uh, design implementation using the, uh, the aqueous uh, optical liquid, uh, which I'll show the spectra uh, here because we use a, 
a mixture of different FDA approved dyes, we get a very corrugated uh, spectra and we're trying to get a flat line uh, black uh, so that we don't get any sort of discoloration, uh, which the carbon black of course has a uh, much better band gap for that. Uh, sure. And we get uh, perfect spectra across as you tune, uh, tune the lens, you always get the flat line and you get no sort of color peaks uh, anywhere. So now, uh, now we'll continue on with the design of our actual mechanical device. So now that we've achieved uh, our optical liquid and we've uh, brought everyone up to speed on why we chose the optical liquid we did and we have the performance that we're hoping to get, we need to integrate this into some type of a physical system. So what we did is we took an optical core where we integrate a sealed reservoir in between two existing lenses and then we create a system where we can simply pump in the liquid using a syringe uh, and then we incorporate it all into the 3D printed parts you see on the right side of the screen which have latex elastomers that provide restorative force to help the lenses return uniformly to a close together position. In this way, you pump in the liquid to make it thicker, you remove the liquid to make it thinner, and the 3D printed part provides some approximation of a, a frame that you have in traditional glasses. So we put everything together, and we achieve the high dynamic range that we were hoping to achieve. So as you can see in the top row, we get very uh, high darkness, very low transmission in the, the top left pane, and we can remove the, the liquid and remove the low transmission state entirely by uh, obviously sucking up with the syringe. And then we incorporated this and proved that it's a scalable and applicable uh, format for incorporating the optical liquid into an actual product where we have goggles that achieve a high dynamic range, as you can see on the bench in front of me. So what we did to help verify that these meet our criteria, I just want to share two uh, tests that we did in particular. And this is showing that we achieve a high dynamic range where we sampled three colors so that you don't have to deal with the entire spectrum. and we plotted them all. Uh, this is representative of the overall uh, amount of transmission that we achieve. And you can see a high dynamic range where we get between 20 and 40 percent transmission depending if you're looking at the red, blue, or green color, uh, when there's no optical liquid present, but then that drops to zero as we fill the optical cavity in our device. And another very important thing is that it happens quickly, and as you can see, in three seconds we achieved this entire change, which was crucial for our performance, and we're very glad that we achieved it. So I just want to summarize the fact that we set out some fairly optimistic performance requirements, and we achieved or exceeded almost all of them, except for uh, the very last row, which is addressed to the optical liquid. So we're very happy with what we've done. We weren't sure if the liquid was going to have some non-uniform thicknesses or if there was going to be other engineering design challenges that we had to overcome. And indeed there were, but through a number of iterations, we have got something that at least performs to a very uh, satisfying level for us. And at this point, this acts as a proof of concept for the one layer design. With time, we can easily scale this to multiple layers, whether it goes up to two or three. Uh, so that we can achieve that color tunability that we were referring to. And once this is incorporated into a product as we uh, achieve higher levels of control of the lens thickness and higher uh, absorbance coefficients on the optical liquid, this will certainly be able to be incorporated into a compelling product that will improve the lives of skiers and athletes around the world. All right. so. As uh, Noah just said, uh, we really nailed the conditions that we were looking to achieve. And we actually were able to show that we, this sort of liquid system, you could integrate, the nice part is you could integrate it into existing lenses, all curvatures and designs by just uh, having two of the same curvatures and sort of compressing the liquid in between. And we showed that with our, uh, our goggles, which are actually on display and you could definitely uh, try them on. They're a big hit this morning. A lot of, uh, there's a huge transition, so we encourage you guys to come to our booth and actually try these on. It's a, the transmission change is about 50%, uh, and when you have it right on your eye, it's, it's night and day difference. It's really cool. So please join us then. And now I just want to touch on uh, maybe some other places where we can apply our, our really thin optical cavity uh, into other sort of products and uh, other markets. Uh, so basically, this just works in between any sort of two clear mediums. So we're thinking about in your, your next smart home, why don't you have liquid shutters? You could basically have it programmed 
or uh, during, uh, during the day when it gets too bright on a certain window, the house will automatically inject some uh, liquid, change the, uh, the tint of your windows. And you could also apply this in two cars. Uh, if, you wanna, if it's too sunny while you're driving, you could actually just tint uh, all your windows on the sides. And you know what? Think about it. In like 10, 20 years when all cars are like self-driving, you don't even need to see through your windshield. You have your windshield go completely black, work as you're going to work, or do whatever in uh, your own. You don't need to have the sun shining on your face if you're trying to any glare on your laptop while you're working in your car. So we see this sort of technology being able to uh, easily tune any sort of uh, glass or clear medium as a, it's a huge market there. And uh, I guess finally, uh, I just want to go through acknowledgements. So we'd like to thank our consultant, uh, Professor Diane Ben, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, but we'd also like to thank uh, Professor Hany Aziz, uh, Jen Coggan, uh, Dr. John Saad, and uh, the Faculty of Engineering. Uh, this work would not have been possible without their assistance, and uh, we sincerely thank them for all the help they've given us. Thank you. Any questions? Right. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned like in the your, uh, previous competitors, science lab choices and that's not enough for old uh, 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 conditions. I'm wondering, would, you, would your three primary colors, you could have potentially all possible tints, but could that create a problem itself of choice? I mean, too, too many choices, what would the user be able to do? In any I'll take this one. Yeah, that's a very valid concern, and oftentimes it's good if there's only maybe two or three choices for consumers. However, we plan to address this by making it fully automated. So with a very simple uh, computer vision system, you could identify the colors, identify the light intensity, and have it tuned to the optical, or sorry, the optimal conditions automatically. So if the user wants to control it, they can, but if you want to automate it, then that would be the ideal. Yeah, and if it's automated, you could actually have set scales for certain, so maybe there'll be a program that says uh, golfing. Here are the tints that are relevant to that, so yeah. those colors would be yeah. cool application. I understand the tint, but I didn't understand how you're changing the color. Can you explain that for uh, So the tint is based on uh, whatever liquid we have. So we could stack these and get more color change. Uh, so the maximum we need is three different colors to get uh, any Are sort you of... Are different cavities? Or is it like different yeah, different cavities. They're, they're spatial, spatially separated. But they're all used in the same suspension. So, so this was a proof of concept with one layer. But theoretically, in that one layer, we could have put a colored uh, optical liquid in. We chose to go with the light transmission attenuation initially, and as we add additional layers, then you can build on the color. So the fluid would have different colors? Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point you mentioned the thickness variance. You said it to 15%. Mm -hmm. Is it that too much? Uh, for thickness variance, we meant to cross the entire lens, so we were, we, we did Okay, we first saw this as being our hardest uh, our design challenge, is getting it perfectly uniform. Uh, and we thought maybe if the variance is a, a large lens, then 50% would not be that big. But it is definitely uh, suboptimal. Uh, and we're glad we beat that by quite a margin. <laughs> we, we wanted to account for edge effects if there was some uh, edge cases, I guess, just to be safe. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion would be if you can look into more more materials for the liquid, you might have a much more interesting performance come out of this. Agreed. We might get very good spectral uniformity, we might have better color tunability and so on. Hundred percent agreed. We had to sort of split our time between focusing on the device versus the optical liquid development. And for a minimum viable product we did uh, focus on an easier dye, agreed, but that is definitely in the next stages. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you, guys.